We are again, guys. Howdy and good morning. Aaron Boster here, and thank you for learning about MS with me. As many of you know, I started this YouTube channel to help my own MS clinic patients learn between visits. And it's my hope that through my videos and through these live streams, I can help you learn too. Today's topic, as always, is talking about multiple sclerosis. To set the ground rules, if this is new to you, if you jump online, please tell me your name and tell me where you're calling in from. It's super fun to hear and learn about this growing online community. And I love it when there's people from faraway places like Toledo, Ohio, or across the pond. Also, I can't diagnose you and I can't treat you over the interwebs. So please keep in mind that I can't answer your personal inquiries about something specific to your situation. If you have a question, please try to frame it in a general way so that we can all benefit. Let's jump in and see who is online with us right now. I've got um, Aaron joining us from Pittsburgh. Hey, Aaron, how are you? Thank you for joining. Um, good morning from Colorado. Hey, Roger, how are you? I've got uh, Puerto Rico on the phone. I've got um, AJHRs, of course. Hello. Um, let me pour uh, my all-important coffee. Uh, Susie Q, good morning. How are you? I had a very fancy espresso machine that I've used religiously for the last five years. Um, it's this Italian machine. It's amazing until it died. Um, I do love a good French press. And look at me. I'm online. My hair's all goofy. Um, I've got Natalie from Illinois on the line. Hello, Natalie. Um, good morning, Dr. Boster. My name is Laura in Montreal. Bon matin, bonjour. I've got Dave from the UK. Uh, good morning, Dave. Great to see you. Multiple sclerosis and me. Hello. You've helped a lot uh, with my learning about MS, and thank you. Uh, I am from Kent in the UK. Well, it's an absolute pleasure. Um, you know, I may never have a chance uh, to see you. Um, I may never have a chance to directly help you and your family in my clinic. And so the fact that I could teach you something through YouTube or through a live stream and have it help you means the world to me. So thank you for jumping online. And thanks for sharing that with me. Um, Marie Joes from, from the Netherlands. Uh, welcome. Good morning. Mm, that coffee tastes good. Um, I've got Patty Hardaway. Good morning, Dr. Bion from Florida. Is a toxic gait cerebellar or sensory? Let's jump in with the very first question. So to unpack that a little bit, a toxic gait, a taxia is Greek, um, and it has to do with the inability to hit the mark, um, to be unsteady. Oftentimes, a taxia specifically refers to um, irregularity in something. So if I'm trying to reach for something with my hand, uh, and my hand is a taxic, um, I might not, I might overshoot it, I might miss it. And an ataxic gait looks like uh, you're drunk or you're on a boat and you don't have your sea legs and your gait is irregular. And so her question is, is an ataxic gait because of the cerebellum or could it be sensory? And you can have both. There's actually something, uh, so most commonly the cerebellum in the back of the brain, cerebellum is Greek for little brain. The uh, cerebellum controls coordination of movement. Um, many of you may be familiar with this substance called alcohol. Um, it comes in delicious forms like beer or bourbon. And alcohol is actually a poison of the cerebellum. So when you drink uh, maybe a little bit more than you intended, you may find uh, that you're a little unsteady on your feet. And, you're, and that's, that's ataxia. And the reason that you're ataxic for the next couple hours is because that cerebellar function is not working fully. And unfortunately, in the setting of MS, we don't need bourbon on board to have ataxia. And many people have had impact to, um, to their cerebellum. But that's not the only way that you can have an unsteady or ataxic gait. And so she also says, well, what about sensory? If you think about it, as you're walking and you place your foot on the ground, there's a sensory system that tells your body where your foot is in space. You can feel the surface of the ground and also the joint angles of your limbs tell your body where it is. And that's sensory information. There are situations both in MS and in other conditions where you lose sensory information. You can't feel your feet or you can't feel the ground or you can't tell where your joint is in space. It's called proprioception. And if you lose those sensory information, 
the result uh, is that you, you don't walk very well. And in fact, you can have what's called a sensory ataxia. And so in order to sort out if someone has an ataxic, unsteady, irregular gait because of the cerebellum, or if it's because of sensory problems, we have to do further testing. Um, there's a uh, video on my channel about balance. And if I remember in the post, I'll throw links down in the description below so you can check that out. And in my balance video, I, I talk about a lot of this. And so it goes into a little bit more depth. That was a great question and a super way of starting off this question and answer. Thank you for asking it. Let's jump back in and see what else we have cooking. Um, so Jen writes, afternoon folks from across the pond in Scotland. Jen, great to see you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Paulina writes in, I'm two weeks post round one of Lemtrada. Next round next year. How does it look after round two? Any further treatment? Or well, round two and that's it. Thanks from Cardiff. Um, Paulina, it's great to hear from you. Thank you for asking the question. So to bring everyone up to speed, the way that alamtuzumab, codename Lemtrada, is given in MS is it's an infusion in the vein taken for five days in a row. So at our center, we do Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And then you wait 12 months. And then you do Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you do three days. So it's five days, wait a year, three days. And we call the first five days round one. And that's what Paulina is referencing. She just completed round one. A year later, she'll do round two, which is three days. And her question is, what happens next? Now, I have a YouTube video specifically answering that question, um, but I would love to share it with you right now. The point here is, is if you want to hear more about it, you can go check that out later. Um, it's in the Lemtrada playlist. After you've completed the two rounds of Lemtrada, then we monitor. We don't retreat with Lemtrada unless you have a new clinical attack or if you have new spots on a future MRI. And in the clinical trials, we used a rule of two new spots before we would retreat. So... The way that I typically do this with our patients, um, where I work at Ohio Health, is we do the first round, wait a year, the second round. Six months after the second round, I get what I call a rebaseline MRI. I get a new MRI and I kind of call into scripture the new radiologic look after Lentrata. Good, bad, or ugly, we're calling in the new rebaseline. And then we move forward in time, getting an MRI about once a year, seeing patients every three to six months. And if there's no attack, if there's no new spots on MRI, then we just keep on keeping on. And of course, you have to do the monitoring for four years after your last dose. I'll come back to that. But if you have a clinical attack or if you have new spots on an MRI, then we hit pause and we have a conversation. And typically, we consider one of three options. Option number one is to do nothing. And for any of you that have seen my videos or are, know me from clinic, I'm not a big fan of doing nothing, but, th but that is an option. A second option is to give a third course of Lemtrada. The third course of Lemtrada is always three days, and it can't be given sooner than a year after the second dose. So it could be given at year three, or it could be given at year seven, but it needs to be after a year after that second course or that second uh, round. The third option is that we could change drugs and use a different drug. Now, most of my patients who have been on Lemtrada and have had breakthrough disease where after the second round they've had an attack or they've had new spots, we've had this conversation and many of them have opted for a third course of Lemtrada. Some of them have opted to change uh, and take a different drug. And again, the monitoring, which is monthly, requires a bunch of safety checks. We want to look at your kidney function. We want to look at your platelet count. We want to look at your thyroid. Now, sometimes we're taking a look at your liver function. And we're going to do that once a month, every month, for four years after your last dose. Now, if let's say you had the first round and then the second round like Paulina has, and then let's say that three years later you have an attack. And this whole time you've been off therapy, but you've been monitored and you have an attack three years later and you opt to have a third round of Lemtrada. You'll have three days of Lemtrada and then you'll have four more years of monitoring after that. And so the monitoring is always four years after the last dose. 
I hope that answers your question. Thank you for asking it. Howdy, Dave from PA. Alex K writes, hey, Dr. B, um, checking in from the UK. I like these live chats. Alex, thank you for joining me. I love your comments on the YouTube channel. Um, I really appreciate you jumping online. Good morning. Um, I've got um, Michelle from California. Uh, that's really awesome. I've got Louise from Portugal. Um, Sarah Chase uh, joins us from West Virginia. Um, I've got Tiffany on the line. Hello, Tiffany from Oregon. Um, Gia writes, are symptoms different due to the placement of the lesions, brain versus spinal cord? No spinal cord lesions, only brain lesions. The answer is yes. The functions of the brain um, are vast. I mean, it really runs, it's the supercomputer that runs the whole body. And when you have multiple sclerosis and there's an acute bout of inflammation, a specific area that goes and it attacks a part of your brain, thinking it's a foreign invader, remember this is autoimmune process, it causes focal damage. And wherever that focal damage in the brain occurs will determine what kind of deficits, if any, the person experiences. Now think about this. All the motor information from the brain gets funneled down into the spinal cord. The spinal cord is like a giant wire or it's like a super highway that takes the information from the brain down um, and then it distributes it to the feet and the arms and the rest of the body. If you are being touched or someone say steps on your foot, that's sensory information. And that sensory information goes up the nerves to the spinal cord and goes up the spinal cord to the brain so that you know that you're being touched or that someone stepped on your foot. So damage to the spinal cord is different than damage in the brain typically. Oftentimes with spinal cord damage, we'll have what we call a level. There'll be a level and below that level, we may have trouble moving a limb or moving both limbs and we may have sensory changes. And above that level, there's nothing wrong. And that's because that spinal cord highway has been affected at a various level. Taking a clinical history and doing a, a formal neurological examination, the neurologist, the clinician can sort out brain versus spinal cord. Keep in mind that people with MS have at risk of both. Now, as Gia points out, some people have a predilection for more brain lesions. Some people have a predilection for more spinal cord lesions. I'll also share that primary progressive multiple sclerosis, the less common form of MS, has a strong predilection for the spinal cord. Um, I have a colleague I used to work with that said primary progressive MS is like a, a progressive myelopathy. Myelopathy is a doctor word for spinal cord problem. And progressive in that, it continues over time. And so there's definitely an increased risk of spinal cord disease in the setting of PPMS. By the way, when it comes to imaging, you know, we very frequently image the brain, but we also should be imaging the spinal cord. I don't think that we need to image the spinal cord every single year, but I do think that it's a best practice to get a spinal cord MRI every couple of years along with the brain. Great question. So a reader writes in, I have six lesions, still active, run five and 10 Ks and work as a police officer with an MS diagnosis. That's fantastic. Um, just because you have MS doesn't mean that you have to give up on a career or a dream necessarily. And I have a lot of people that I take care of that have MS, that are police officers, that are firemen, that are nurses and doctors and engineers and professors. Um, and they, they come from all walks of life. And our goal is to keep you engaged and keep you the most awesome you possible. And if your goal is to keep working, to keep you working, as long as you can and as robustly as you can. I think it's great that you're working as a cop. And I think it's great that you're running five and 10 Ks. You know, one of the things that we know to be true is that people with MS that exercise as part of their lifestyle, they fare better. They literally do better long-term compared to those that don't. And so your running is a really big deal to me. Um, there's a, a, an amazing MS neurologist named Gavin Giovannoni. Uh, so he's at Bart's uh, in London. And he talks a lot about brain health, um, brain health, things that are healthy for your brain. And one of the big ones is exercise. Exercise in, maintains brain volume. It keeps uh, your, your, your body younger and, and it lets you handle MS better. And let me give you just a quick example. 
if I took a person with MS and I cloned you, so now there's two of you, so your spouse can either say thank you or they can get mad at me, but there's two copies of you. In clone A, we give chocolate cake and daytime television. So you sit there and don't move around and eat chocolate cake. Clone B, we're going to give an elliptical and carrots. And we'll get back together in five years. Now, clone A is deconditioned. He's out of shape. He's gained some weight. His cardiovascular, not so good. But he knows everything there is to know about days of our lives and daytime TV and soap operas, etc. Now, clone B is fit. He's lost weight. He's got a strong core. He's got flexibility. He's got good cardiovascular endurance. And then I get out a Harry Potter magic wand and I cast a spell of a left leg attack, an MS attack, making the left leg weak. Clone A is deconditioned and seated in a wheelchair looking up. Clone B is limping. And I ask my patients oftentimes, which, which clone do you want to be? Do you want to be the clone that's deconditioned and at risk? Or do you want to be prehabilitated? Because really, that's what you're doing by running 5 and 10 Ks is you're prehabilitating. Strong legs handle attacks much better than weak ones. And during times when you're able to exercise, boy, I really want you to do that. Now, not everyone can run a 5K. Not everyone can run a 10K. Not everyone can run. And if you're not able to run, then find a different activity. Find chair yoga or do a water Zumba class or swim in a pool or participate in some other exercise activity because what we want is we want movement. And so if you're struggling to find an activity that allows you to be physically active, I implore you to talk to your MS provider so they can brainstorm or talk to your local chapter of the MS Society um, or to other support groups and ask about opportunities for exercise. I'm very proud that at my center, we've started an exercise wellness program with some amazing neurophysical therapists that is geared towards people with MS. It's a class that occurs twice a week, Tuesday nights and Thursday nights. And each day, it's about an hour. There's a focus on cardiovascular endurance using a stationary bicycle. There is a focus on balance and strengthening the core and stretching and flexibility. And then we cap off the class with some education. The patients that participate in this particular program, these people with MS are given uh, pedometers so they can start to track their steps. They're given uh, binders so that they can keep uh, exercise journals. And we ask them to add in one exercise uh, session on a Saturday or Sunday. We've now been running this class for a couple of years. It's a three month gig. And I'll tell you that people that embrace this class, this wellness experience, come out on the other end different. They come out energized. They come out in better shape. They come out and oftentimes they tell me, doc, I'm not as tired. I don't need my symptomatic medicines as much. I feel so much better. And I want you guys to experience that. And so please keep in mind, that exercise is a key part of success to wellness, to brain health, and to beating MS. So thank you for the police officer that brought up the question. So I've got uh, someone joining us from Istanbul, uh, amazing city. It's great to see you. Um, so MS Karam writes in, and I'm sorry, guys, I'm not really good at names, so please forgive me, uh, writes in, have you um, have had many MRIs, um, but only one um, that included the thoracic spine, which had a lesion? Why is thoracic spine usually not checked? Excellent question. So a few minutes ago, I talked about the importance of getting a brain MRI, and I'm of the opinion that you need a brain MRI once a year. And I talked about the spinal cord and how we don't image the, the cervical spinal cord every single year. And I typically recommend doing it every couple years. And this nice person reminds us, well, what about the rest of the spinal cord? What about the thoracic spinal cord? Now, I have gotten into the general practice of ordering a spinal cord, cervical and thoracic, when I meet a patient, as a new patient. And we don't generally image the thoracic spine repeatedly every single time. And we do it less often than we do the cervical spine. And there's a reason. It's because of real estate. The cervical spinal cord is really thick. 
and the spinal cord tapers and gets thinner and thinner as it goes down. The thoracic spinal cord is thinner and has less myelin and statistically speaking, might be less likely to be affected. Now that doesn't mean that people can't have lesions in the thoracic spine and they can. And I absolutely think that if you're having a new clinical manifestation below the belt, if you're having just trunk or just below the belt legs, then I think that we have to think about the thoracic spinal cord. If you've never had your thoracic spinal cord imaged, it is reasonable to ask your MS clinician, hey, we've never looked, shouldn't we? And I think the answer should be yes. Um, I do not think that the thoracic spine needs imaged as often as the cervical spine. And also keep in mind, at least in the United States, these scans are expensive. And each of them take a half an hour to an hour to obtain. So asking a claustrophobic patient to go in the scanner for an hour for a brain MRI is asking a lot. And so sometimes we have to kind of meter out what we ask them to do because I don't want to stick you in the scanner for three hours. Uh, you probably tell me no. What else do we have going on? I've got Jim saying hello. Howdy, Jim. I've got Cindy on the line. Is spinal MRI included the thoracic region? So hopefully, Cindy, I just answered that. At least in the United States, when we order uh, spine imaging, we order the specific part, cervical, thoracic, or lumbar. I do not find lumbar spine MRIs to be helpful in the setting of MS. They can be very helpful to answer other questions. I think if you're going to image the spine, the cervical spine is the money shot. And I think if you get this thoracic spine secondarily, that can also be helpful. So AJHR writes, oh, wow, Jen, um, that's encouraging. I'm barely comfortable with MS needle monthly. Uh, I'm not ready for Botox. So it looks like I missed a comment that Jen made. Um, oh, so Jen had an occipital nerve block. Jen, that's awesome. So, you know, it's not uncommon that people with MS have headaches. And headaches are really common in general. And people with MS are more likely to suffer from headaches. Now, Jen explains that she recently had a very simple procedure called an occipital nerve block, where you load up some numbing and you load up some steroids and you inject it in, into the protuberance right there in the back of the head. And for what we call a cervicogenic headache, a headache that's coming from that junction at the base uh, of, of the neck, it can do wonders. It's amazing. Um, I have a colleague I work with that does these injections. I don't do them myself. She's really good at it. And we've had a lot of patients that have had benefit. I'm not telling you that all headaches uh, should be managed with an occipital nerve block. That's silly. But I am telling you that it's a heck of a good tool. And I like it a lot because an occipital nerve block has no systemic effects. So there's no, um, there's no interactions with other medicines. It's not, you know, beating up on your liver or your kidneys. And oftentimes it'll hold a headache at bay either knock it out of the park forever, or it'll last for months and months and might need to be repeated very infrequently. It's a cool procedure. Matt R. joins us. He writes, hello, Dr. Boster. I was taking supplements that are meant to boost the immune system, green tea, ginger, counterproductive to the goal of MS immunosuppressants. Matt, that's an excellent question. Now, there's a lot of um, health food products that say things that um, they boost the immune system. They're immune boosters. And he gives examples of ginseng and green tea and that they're immune boosters. And I think that we have to really contemplate what they're telling us. If a product, uh, whether that be a green tea or some supplement that you buy at a store, really did boost the immune system, that would be bad for MS. People with MS have an overly active immune response. They don't need anything to boost their immune system. They need oftentimes to dampen their immune system because their own immune system is so overly active, it's actually attacking themselves. And so we would not want to boost the immune system. And when, when I hear about a, a product, um, and sometimes there's actually pills that you can buy at health food stores that boost the immune response. I'm delighted that they probably don't work because if they did work, uh, they would hurt you potentially. Um, I don't think that green tea boosts the immune system the way that we're talking. Um, I, I can't speak intelligently about the details of green tea. Uh, I know that it is one of the most consumed substances on earth. Um, and it may have some uh, properties that are, are healthy, 
Um, but I'm not sure that it's actually boosting the immune system. And I mean that at the immunologic level, that it's turning on white blood cells and getting them all riled up and kicking them up a notch. I don't know that that's what's happening with green tea. Um, your point's outstanding, that if there was something that boosted the immune system, that might be bad for you. There are medicines that boost the immune system. There are medicines that force the white blood cells to rapidly reproduce. And those medicines might place us at risk for MS attacks, etc. Um, if you are interested in taking a supplement, um, a, a, whatever that supplement may be, I recommend strongly that before taking it, you bring it to the attention of your MS provider and say, hey, I've got this medicine right here, or I've got this, this pill, or I've got this powder, and I'm thinking about taking it. What do you think? And it gives the clinician an opportunity to do some homework, to look it up, and, and to make sure that you're not placing yourself at risk. Um, we have to be careful about what we put in our bodies. Now, do I think you should shy away from green tea? No, I don't. I think green tea is delicious. Um, and I think it's a pretty healthy option. But I really do appreciate the question. Immune boosters, if they worked, would be bad for you in the setting of MS or in another auto-reactive, autoimmune process where uh, you, you don't want to push the immune system up anymore. You want to kind of get it to calm down. Jim says, well, I lost the question. Sorry, Jim. Um, again, you guys know that I'm not super great at doing this. I'm trying to read and then talk at the same time while drinking coffee, and sometimes I get a little befuddled. All right, so let me try to find the next question. Um, someone writes in this video chat is awesome. I'm thrilled to be here um, from Puerto Rico. Um, well, I'm glad you're here too, and I kind of wish I was in Puerto Rico because, wow, it's beautiful. Um, here we go. Uh, Jim writes, brain C and T spine is a long time in the MRI too. Man, you are absolutely right. Um, I think that getting a brain MRI once a year, if you have MS, particularly if you're on a therapy, is an appropriate thing to do. As I mentioned earlier, I like to get the C spine maybe every two or three years. And I really only get the thoracic spine if there's new symptoms attributable to the thoracic spine. So, um, so I've got a question. So I'm waiting on my MS diagnosis. I know I have it. I'm just waiting to get it on paper. The thing is that I worry so much over it, over this, that I'm having a lot of symptoms. Um, how should I calm down? That is an excellent question. Um, and so I want to spend some time uh, answering that for you. Now, this is a journey and it's not a sprint. It's a marathon. The journey includes um, sorting out initial symptoms and going through the process of testing to determine a diagnosis. And that journey is stressful by itself. For those that have been given an MS diagnosis, the journey changes. And now it's about trying to prevent attacks and prevent disability and prevent new MRI spots. And there's a lot of unknown in MS. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of unknown unknown about the diagnosis, unknown about what's going to happen tomorrow. And it's very easy for people with MS to suffer from anxiety over that. And, and that makes perfect sense. Um, I have many patients tell me they wake up in the morning and they do a check. Can I see out of my left eye? Can I see out of my right eye? Is my one hand working? Is my other hand working? Do my feet work? Okay, let's try to wake up. Waking up and not knowing um, would be terrifying. And I want to give you some advice uh, that my mentor uh, used to give patients in clinic, um, and I now share with patients in clinic. We can be proactive. We can be preemptive. We can do what we know how to do to quell MS and, and to give you the best chance. We can take a disease-modifying therapy. We can not smoke cigarettes. We can supplement low levels of vitamin D and eat healthy, and we can exercise as part of our lifestyle. In, in the setting of doing those things, if you're going to have an attack, you're going to have an attack. And you don't have to go looking for it. Here's the advice. We don't worry about the flat tire we don't have. You're not driving your car down the highway and casually say, honey, do you think the front left tire just blew up? Nobody says that. If the front left tire blows up, you don't have to ask yourself if it blew up. You know that it blew up. And you pull over on the side of the road and I tell my, my patients I'm their mechanic. Now, you, if you are going to have a second attack, if you are going to have an MS diagnosis, there's nothing you can do to prevent that. 
And spending energy worrying about it won't change anything. All it will do is make you anxious. If you have MS, worrying about whether or not you're going to have something bad happen tomorrow won't change it. It'll just make you anxious. And I would much rather us focus on things that we can control. Are you exercising? Are you avoiding tobacco? Are you living a healthy lifestyle and making good food choices? Are you supplementing low levels of vitamin D? If you're diagnosed, are you taking your medicine? Those are things that you control. And you want to focus on those things. If you have an MS attack, you're going to know it. You can't hide it. You're going to have a new neurological deficit that's going to last longer than 24 hours. And I'm going to come back to that rule, the 24-hour rule here in a second. And if you experience that, you're going to reach out to your MS provider and we're going to take care of it. Spending time or energy worrying about it doesn't help. And so I think that we really have to consider mindfulness. We really have to recenter ourselves because spending energy worrying about it just makes us anxious. Now, I made reference to the 24-hour rule. And as soon as I pour myself some more coffee, I'm going to tell you about the 24-hour rule. Man, I didn't plan very well. I'm sitting in front of this camera, and this is all the coffee I have left. That's not going to cut it, guys. <laughs> Just a little bit of milk, and the coffee is ready. Now, the 24-hour rule is something that I think is extremely helpful um, as you're getting used to your, your body and your, your new diagnosis of MS and trying to figure out, when do I need to alert my medical professional? Here it goes. If you wake up in the morning and your hand's numb, and you shake it out and it feels better, you don't need to call. If you wake up in the morning and your hand's numb, and the next morning it's more numb, now you need to call. Multiple sclerosis attacks are caused by inflammation. Inflammation doesn't go away in under 24 hours. Think about it. Let's pretend that someone punched me in my cheek, and my cheek gets all puffy. It's puffy because of inflammation. Tomorrow, it's not normal. Tomorrow, it's actually more puffy because inflammation doesn't go away in a day. When you have an MS attack, it's caused by inflammation in the brain or the spinal cord, and it will manifest neurological symptoms, and they're going to last longer than a day. So if you have a new symptom, I want you to ask yourself the question, is it going on for less than a day? If it hasn't gone on for a day, I think it's okay to wait. Now, use common sense. I mean, God forbid, if you're having trouble swallowing, you need to take care of that. But my point is, if you're having a numbness and you're not sure, if it goes on for more than 24 hours, then it's acting like an MS inflammation. I think it's valuable to bring to the attention of your provider. Whenever someone is given a diagnosis of a chronic condition, or when you're, to my friend's point, considering a diagnosis of a chronic condition, the human being becomes more aware of their own body. This is a true phenomenon. In things that have been going on for a long time, you're going to pay more attention to. For example, as I'm talking to you, I have some itches. I'm itching right here, and I'm kind of itching back there. Now, I don't know why I'm itching. Uh, maybe it's because I just woke up, um, but who, who knows? And if I was given a diagnosis of a chronic condition, I might ask a reasonable question. Is the itching related to the condition? And if you do that, you, you can spin, you can, start to, you can start to wonder and get yourself worked up. And so I want you to ask the question, how long has the itching been going on? For me, the itching has been going on for a minute or two. And so I would teach myself, I'm not going to worry about that one. Now, if I had itching that wasn't going away and it lasted for over 24 hours, then I would want to reinterpret it. And then I would be bringing it to the attention of the provider. And so I hope that helps you. Sometimes we have to force ourselves to think about other things. Now, many of you that have jumped online, and there's 85 of you, which warms my heart, you're impacted by multiple sclerosis. Maybe you have MS, maybe you're being worked up for MS, and maybe you have a loved one that has MS, or maybe you're an MS provider. Um, and the internet is a resource, but it needs to be used wisely. You can get yourself down Alice in Wonderland's rabbit hole reading weird things on the internet. All of us have done this. A couple nights ago, I couldn't sleep. Um, and I'll share with you that I have a silly passion. I love martial arts and mixed martial arts as a spectator. 
Um, and I found myself watching video after video after video of fight breakdowns. And I did it for hours and hours. Um, and I should have been sleeping. Uh, and the next day I was exhausted in clinic. My, my point here is that you can fall down a rabbit hole on the internet. And if you're struggling with a diagnosis or you're struggling with symptoms and you find yourself going down that internet rabbit hole, stop, close the computer, turn off the phone and go outside, go for a walk or breathe some fresh air, play with your pet or engage with a loved one, but change up the script and get yourself to take a break. Because remember, you can't stop it from happening if it's gonna, but you can make yourself really, really anxious. So I, I hope that's helpful information. So many people that I talk with impacted by MS struggle with this, and it's really, really important. You know, there's actually a great role for meditation, for mindfulness, and sometimes we, we benefit from talking to a trained listener who can help us deal with the stress of the not knowing. They can help us grapple with the stress of the unknown. Um, there are skills that you can learn to help you grow, cope with that. And so I hope that's helpful. And I really appreciate the question. And I really love coffee. So how do you from Michigan? Christina writes, hello, go blue. Um, I'll be taking biotin for hair loss with Lemtrada. Um, oh, will taking biotin for hair loss with Lemtrada affect monthly lab draws? Also vaping nicotine. Um, on trying to quit cigarettes. Two questions. Number one, uh, Lymtrata, in my experience, doesn't cause hair loss. So I've given um, a lot of people Lymtrata, and I haven't had any of them report hair loss. And I was a clinical trial investigator. Um, I was involved in some of the phase three clinical trials. I'm not familiar with Lymtrata causing hair loss. So if you're having some hair falling out, I would look for other things beyond Lymtrata that might cause that. Biotin B7 is a, is a vitamin that you can buy over the counter. And biotin is supposed to improve the quality of your hair and your nails. Very obviously, um, I don't take biotin. <laughs> um, and the dose, at least in the United States, that you buy over the counter is three milligrams. Taking three milligrams of biotin is not going to mess up your laboratories. The dose that we use in MS to treat progression, and again, um, I've done videos on this, but there's some research that suggests that ultra high dose biotin, 300 milligrams a day, might be able to slow um, some aspects of primary progressive MS. That's amazing. But 300 milligrams of biotin can impact laboratories, specifically thyroid labs. So if you have received Lemtrada, you're getting monthly labs. And every three months, they're checking a the thyroid. If you're taking high-dose biotin, it will impact your labs. And you have to make sure that you tell your MS provider that you're on high-dose biotin. And you want to stop it um, at least three days, if not a week, before every single lab draw. Otherwise, you're going to have spurious results. You're going to have um, fake results that are going to really, really confuse us. Now, the second question is she says she's vaping nicotine. Now, smoking is not good for MS. And... Uh, there's a thought that transitioning from an analog cigarette where you can bust the cigarette and, and you're smoking the tobacco and you're smoking in carbon dioxide and you're smoking in carbon monoxide and ugh, is bad for you, that maybe if you vape, it's better. And in some ways, it probably is better because you're not sucking in all the same carcinogens um, and it's a different nicotine delivery device. Now, here's the thing. If you've taken Lemtrada, there's evidence that smokers increase the risk of thyroid autoimmunity times three. Keeping in mind that thyroid autoimmunity is about 40%, times three puts you over 100%. Basically, smoking after Lemtrada, you're begging for a thyroid problem. And we don't know whether vaping uh, minimizes that risk. Now, quitting smoking uh, and, and quitting nicotine addiction is one of the single hardest addictions to overcome by humans. It's a really big deal. So I am not trying to give you a hard time. I'm not making a value judgment, but it is in your best interest to avoid. And if the way that you're going to transition off of analog cigarettes is to vape, okay, but there has to be a plan. Um, oftentimes when you buy a, a vape pen, you can buy these cartridges and, and at least in the United States, they call it juice. It's a liquid that contains nicotine. 
and you insert the cartridge into the uh, vape pen. If you do that, there's a trick that each time you buy a new cartridge, buy a lower dose of nicotine and you can slowly decrease the dose. And some people, they'll start to mix uh, zero nicotine with low nicotine and they'll slowly taper themselves down. I love it when you get to the point where you may be vaping, but there's no nicotine in it. And I think that's a clever way of trying to uh, quit nicotine addiction. Now, obviously, um, it's a challenge, uh, and it's something that we need to really, really focus and tackle on. Thank you for asking the questions. So El Holly writes, hi, Dr. B. I finally made it to a live broadcast um, in not so sunny Southern California. Um, one bed of insomnia. Y you're right. Um, I suffer from insomnia. As my grandma said, I'm not a very good sleeper. So I'm really glad that you could join me online. Welcome, welcome, and thank you for joining us. So Jen uh, Carter writes, AJ, um, uh, Jen is again talking about the occipital nerve blocks. Um, someone writes in, any tips and tricks uh, when brushing teeth? My hand is weak and hard to control. Uh, that's a great point. You know, sometimes MS can affect the, the coordination of our hands or the sensation of our hands, or they can, it can impact the strength of our hands. And they make it, it can make it hard to do activities of daily living. Brushing your teeth is an example of that. And if you think about it, there's a tremendous amount of dexterity involved in holding a toothbrush and getting it in your mouth and brushing your teeth. And so it's a very good question. What do you do if you're having trouble doing that? The answer is adaptations, and I'll share two of them with you. The first adaptation is to work with an occupational therapist. An occupational therapist is a wizard that helps you with activities of daily living. And they help you do things like figure out ways to hold a spoon, figure out ways to hold a fork, figure out ways to sign your name and to brush your teeth. They can sometimes give you strengthening and flexibility exercises, and they can be profoundly helpful in coming up with adaptive tools, which brings me to my second point. If you're having trouble brushing your teeth, you might move away from an analog toothbrush. And you might, if you can afford it, buy an electric toothbrush. I actually use an electric toothbrush. They're kind of cool. So I have this toothbrush which sits on a, re a charging station and I put my toothpaste on, I press a button and it vibrates. And all I have to do is hold it up against my teeth. And you may find instead of having to manipulate a toothbrush with your hand, if you can use an electric toothbrush, you may fare much better. Again, uh, I, I, I recommend strongly if you're having trouble with coordination and with clumsiness, that you seek out an occupational therapist, an OT. Uh, they're amazing people with very specialized training and they can be super helpful. We at our comprehensive MS center have some really top-notch occupational therapists and they've helped a lot of patients um, overcome difficulties with tremor and difficulties with weakness and clumsiness of their hands. Great question, thank you for bringing it up. So Debbie Cotto writes in, Botox has helped my migraines and my bladder so much. You're right. Botox is pretty fantastic. Um, Botox can be used to treat migraines. Uh, my uh, partner, Dr. Nicholas, is a grand wizard of Botox. Um, I refer many of my migraine patients to her. She's nice enough to see them uh, for me, and she does Botox to the back of the head, and it can really clear up uh, headaches. It's pretty fantastic stuff. Bladder Botox is massively underappreciated. And I have an amazing urologist, a guy named Ketul Shaw. Um, I love this man. Um, and he does bladder Botox. He does it in his office. It can be a game changer for people with bladder problems. And so if you're having bladder problems and you've tried a few pills and it's not working, it's reasonable to consider bladder Botox. Um, I have patients that were mad at me that I didn't recommend it sooner because it's been such an amazing game changer for them. Really good stuff. Um, Talene Bright writes, doctor, I asked you before. Oh, I'm sorry I, that you asked before. All right, let's see what your question is. I'm on Rebif for months ago, and now I have strange feelings in the left side, even my face. Um, it's so strong. Do I need steroids now? Or must I change my medication? So first of all, I'm sorry that you're having symptoms. Uh, and I interpret that you're, you're developing new neurological symptoms. So I can't tell you over the internet whether or not that symptom is an MS attack 
whether it's a worsening of a baseline symptom because of an exacerbating factor, like you have a urinary tract infection, um, or you have a cold, or you're sleep deprived and it's, it's kicking up old symptoms, mm -hmm. or if you have a separate process like a Bell's palsy. So how do you sort that out? You have to go see your MS provider, schedule an appointment in clinic, get in with your MS provider or your general provider, and they can do some investigations. They're probably gonna wanna do a urinalysis. analysis, they're gonna listen to your heart and lungs and make sure that you don't have a cold or an infection. They're gonna look for other neurological causes. Now, the question is, do I need steroids? And if you determine that you're having an MS attack, steroids may be very appropriate. If you're not having an MS attack, if, if this is being driven by a urinary tract infection, we don't wanna give you steroids, we wanna give you antibiotics. And if it's a separate process, I gave an example of the Bell's palsy, there's different treatment for that. The other question is, do I need to change my drug? Again, we have to first clarify what the sensory changes are from. If it's an MS attack and you've been taking your Rebif, then that's breakthrough disease activity. And in my world, that's rationale to talk about escalation or talk about a new drug. It's all predicated on the fact that as a human being, you don't know offhand whether it's an attack or whether it's a pseudo attack, uh, worsening of old symptoms because of an infection uh, or some other exacerbating factor, or if it's something else, you, you'll know that. You just know that you have symptoms. You're just experiencing something. And it oftentimes takes the assistance of an outside observer, the assistance of the MS provider to help decode, to sort out what it is. Once we know what it is, then we can answer your questions. So the take home here is I need you to see your MS provider. And thank you for asking the question. So Lynn writes, I saw someone ask a question about pseudobulbar affect or PBA. Can you discuss how to manage it? Yes. So pseudobulbar affect is a really, really frustrating symptom. It's fortunately rare in MS. Um, and so let's spend some time talking about it. When you um, are sad, when you feel sad, two things happen. You have an internal emotion of sadness and you have an external affect of sadness. So you look sad and you feel sad, both, and they're coupled together. Think about um, watching an actor on stage. The actor on stage during the course of a play or a production or a movie has an affect of being sad. They're crying, but they don't feel sad inside. They're acting. So there, they lack the emotion but they're manifesting the affect on purpose because they're, they're doing a performance. There are other times where someone might feel sad inside, but they're stoic and they don't look sad to the outside. Most often though, when you feel sadness, you express an affect of sadness and those two things are linked. It turns out that there is some brain circuitry that links those things together, which makes sense. And that brain circuitry really is in the front of the brain, the prefrontal cortex up here. There are situations in the setting of multiple sclerosis and other conditions where there's damage to the front of the brain and the emotion of sadness and the affect, the outward appearance are disconnected. And so the human being with this problem, and this problem is called pseudo bulbar affect, they don't feel sad inside and yet they're bawling. They're the waterworks, they're crying and they're crying. And to everyone outside, they look sad. And they're sitting there crying and through tears saying, I'm not sad, I'm not sad, as they're crying. It's because there's a disconnect between the emotion and the affect. And so sometimes that's called pathologic crying. And it's not limited just to sadness. There are also situations where laughter occurs and the outward affect, ha, 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 is that they think something's very, very funny, except they don't think anything's funny inside. And this is profoundly frustrating. I have a patient that shared with me a terrible story. Her father, who she loved very much, passed away. And she attended her father's funeral, and she laughed at the funeral. She wasn't remotely happy. She was terribly sad inside. But she was laughing outwardly. And everyone around her thought she was being disrespectful and rude to her father. Telling this story hurts me. She has pseudobulbar affect and she wasn't happy. 
she couldn't control this pathologic laughter. And my heart goes out to her because it, it interrupted her ability to grieve. I have many patients that have uh, pathologic laughing or pathologic crying, and it's really frustrating. And so let me share with you two ways that we can manage it. Number one is education. I want the person with pseudobulbar affect to understand, and I want them to educate those around them. Hey, listen, I have this symptom of MS called pseudobulbar affect, and sometimes I might start laughing, except I don't think it's funny, or I might start crying and I don't think it's sad, and I want you to know that. So when I'm crying and I tell you I'm okay, I'm actually really okay. Teaching those around you, your village, about pseudobulbar affect is one of the things that we have to do to manage it. The second thing is there's medications. There are some really good medications that can help manage pseudobulbar affect. Um, there's a class of medicines called tricyclic antidepressants, uh, which we've used for years and years to treat this condition. Um, there's a specific medicine I was taught to use called amipramine that, that works pretty darn well. Sometimes uh, antidepressants, the SSRI medicines like Zoloft and Prozac can be very, very helpful. And there's even um, a, a, a branded medicine called Nudexta. That's a brand medicine, Nudexta. And Nudexta is actually approved in America by the FDA for pseudobulbar affect. And that's the one that I use the most. Um, and it can be a game changer in helping someone not cry when they're not feeling sad or not laugh when they're not feeling happy. So that's pseudobulbar affect. Now, one of my most popular videos on YouTube is uh, called um, Rare and Unusual Symptoms That I've Seen in Clinic. And if you haven't checked that out, uh, consider checking it out. I'll try to leave a link down in the description below if I remember. Uh, and in that video, I talk about pseudobulbar affect. So if you'd like to hear more about it, um, it's one of the rare symptoms of MS that I talk about. So Shannon writes, hello, I was wondering, can MS cause spasms in private area in women? Yes, it absolutely can. You know, MS can impact all the functions of the body because it's the brain, the supercomputer that runs the body and the spinal cord, the superhighway. And that can affect the down there's. And that can have a major impact on bowel, bladder, and sexual function. And so she says, what about spasms to my down there's, to my lady parts, to my private parts? And the answer is that it can. There's a lot of muscles in your pelvic floor. I mean, a lot of muscles. And they have to do all kinds of maneuvering when you defecate or when you go to the bathroom or during intercourse. And those muscles can spasm. Whew, that can hurt. And so, yes, yes, yes. You absolutely can have spasms of the bladder, spasms of the, of the pelvic floor, and it can be exceedingly painful. What do you do about it? Well, there's a lot of things you can do about it. My favorite technique is to use pelvic floor physical therapy. Pelvic floor physical therapy is amazing. And we have some of the best pelvic floor physical therapists that I've ever had the pleasure of meeting um, at Ohio Health where I get to work. And they've helped a lot of people deal with spasms of the pelvic floor. And there's a term called dyspareunia. Dyspareunia is an ugly term. It means pain with intercourse. And they can help with dyspareunia. They can help with bladder spasms. There are medicines that can help. I have some patients that take a vaginal suppository um, of Valium. So they insert um, uh, a suppository of Valium into the vagina and it's absorbed through the walls of the vagina and it can help calm down those areas. There's a lot that can be done. Um, there's even extreme examples where people need botulinum toxin, Botox to the down there's to help with spasms. So that is a symptom in MS. It's a terrible symptom in MS and there is treatment for it. Thank you for asking. Let's see here. Hello from Silver City. Hey, Don, how are you? Um, so Michael Murphy writes, another good question. What happens if you don't trust your neurologist? That's a really, really good question. So what happens if you're not feeling the love with your neurologist? There's a term called therapeutic alliance. The therapeutic alliance is the trust, it's the love between you and your provider. And therapeutic alliance is really, really important. If you don't trust your MS provider, it's going to be really hard to accept what they're telling you. 
the advice that they're giving you, the medicines they prescribe to you, the recommendations that they give to you. Similarly, if your MS provider can't trust you, it, it damages the relationship. If I can't trust that you're going to do the things you say you're going to do and that you're going to take the medicines the way that I'm asking and that you're committed to this fight the way that I'm committed to this fight, it challenges the therapeutic alliance. And if you can't trust, I think that needs to be discussed. I think that you as an adult need to say, I'm having a trust issue and I just want you to bring it out in the open. Um, sometimes patients with trepidation will bring this up to me. Um, I'm not perfect and my personality is not for everybody. Um, some people surprisingly find me to be overbearing or overwhelming. And, and I understand that. And if we don't have a therapeutic alliance, it, it might not be a good fit. And so I think that for starters, my recommendation is bring it up to the provider. Say, hey, I need to talk about our therapeutic alliance and I'm having some concerns trusting. And I think it's reasonable to have a conversation. And that goes for the provider also. If I'm having trouble trusting you, I need to bring that up to you. And hopefully, as two caring adults on the same team in the same village with the same goals, you can work through that. If you can't work through that, I think you need to find a different MS provider. And it's not uncommon, actually, that I will see a patient in consultation and they've been seeing someone. And I'll ask them, why are you coming to see me? And they'll say, I, I wasn't able to trust my provider. X or Y happened. And I'm really appreciative when they bring that up because I want to level set expectations up front. Very often, there's concerns um, that are on the table because of poor communication. And maybe the lack of trust is based on a misunderstanding. And so I think that the mature thing to do in any adult relationship is to look the person in the eyes and tell them how you're feeling and work it out. And if you can't work it out, find a different provider. Excellent question. Thank you for asking that. All right. What do we have next here? Um, Michael Murphy says, I have asked you three questions and you have not answered any of them. Ah, well, Michael, for starters, I think I just answered one of your questions. Number two, I'm dyslexic. Um, it's really hard for me to read quickly and it's really hard for me to read out loud. And I've got 108 people online and I'm trying to stare at a camera and then look down and read. And if I missed your questions, I am very sorry. I didn't do it to insult you and I didn't do it to be rude. I'm trying really hard to do this and I'm doing it by myself really early in the morning. Maybe one day I'll have a team of people that help me do this. Um, I've seen how they do this on YouTube where they have people that are reading the questions and they're feeding the presenter the questions who's reading it. And that way I can answer all of them. Also, Michael, I try to do these after party videos where I go back and I try to answer questions and I put out a video. And so please don't take personal offense. I'm not doing it on purpose. I'm trying to do the very best I can. Um, and I hope that you're enjoying your morning all the same. So I love this name, Blasmic Atheist. Ohio Health is better than OSU. Mm. So, so those are two healthcare systems in my own city. And what I would like to say is that it's amazing that here in central Ohio, we have a lot of really good providers and really great places where people can seek care. And I do not want to get into he's better than her or we're better than them. I would rather think of this as an on, uh, overall community. We're all having the same goal. And if you seek out care and it works for you, I think that's awesome. Now, I'm a little biased. Um, I really like where I work a whole lot. I feel really passionate about it. But that doesn't mean that you're not going to get good care elsewhere. So let's not hate. Um, and uh, le let's keep in mind that we all have the same goal. We're all trying to take care of people. Um, I think that the providers at other centers, they care and they want to try real hard and they want to do the best they can. So um, someone writes in, Dr. B, you're really one of a kind. What you're doing is huge for our community. I wish there were, uh, that every city had a Dr. B. Thank you for Montreal. Cela fait grand plaisir pour moi d'entendre ça. Je vous remercie fortement. Merci bien. I, um, I really appreciate you saying that. Um, you know, many of you know my own personal story. Uh, I decided to be an MS doc when I was 12, uh, not because my uncle had MS. He had had MS for a long time. 
but because my family was scared and alone and they couldn't get a hold of their MS provider. Um, actually in this town, Columbus, Ohio. And um, my family was scared and my mother was crying. And I told my mother that I would learn to do it better. I buried my uncle several years ago. Uh, my grandparents, who are his primary care providers, uh, my grandfather, who is one of the biggest mentors in my life, has passed. And I can't help them anymore. Maybe I can help you. I can't right that wrong. That terrible doctor that took care of my family poorly, um, I, I can't undo what he did. Um, but I can try to help a future family. I can try to help another family in my hometown. Um, and one of the things that I am so passionate about is reaching out and trying to help you guys. Again, that's why I started this YouTube channel. It's because maybe someone in Cardiff in the UK or someone in, um, in Puerto Rico or someone in some other area of the world who I might not get to help directly in clinic can watch one of my videos or maybe they're watching this live stream. And maybe I can help them with a piece of information that improves the quality of their life. Um, that's really what I'm trying to do here, guys. Um, I'm not on YouTube because I'm trying to make money. I'm not on YouTube, honestly, because I'm trying to get famous. Uh, although a lot of my friends tease me <laughs> that that's what I'm trying to do. Uh, I'm trying to deliver MS education. I'm trying to empower you. I'm trying to energize you. And I'm trying to educate you to help you be the most awesome you possible. So thank you very much for those kind words. Um, there's a lot of doctors out there. There's a lot of clinicians out there that care a whole lot. Um, I'm just one of them. Um, and I really am glad that this forum, this crazy uh, internet forum is one that we can take advantage of. It's a cool thing. Um, and I'll share with you that this is a really cool online community. Um, thank you for saying that. That really makes my day. Um, what else we got here? Um, thank you, Dr. Boster, for your videos. You're very, very welcome. Uh, thanks for sharing your stories to Salesbury. You're welcome. Um, it's a story that's sometimes a little bit hard to share. Um, Jen writes, your family must be proud of you. You're helping me and my family all the way in Scotland. <laughs> that's freaking awesome. <laughs> yeah. Linda writes in, you are helping people. Yay. Um, so Silver says, I have an endocrinologist um, trying to recommend bariatric surgery. What do you think about that? I have relapsing MS. So that's a fantastic thing to talk about. People with MS sometimes have trouble moving and they sometimes have motor fatigue and heat sensitivity um, and they have weakness in their legs and it's very hard to exercise. Now, when it's hard to move, there's a risk of gaining weight because you're eating food because you have to eat food to live for, to run your body, but, but you can't burn off the calories the way that you do when you're walking about and when you're climbing and when you're exercising. And so people with MS, because of that, are at an increased risk of being overweight. Now, there's a problem with that. Being overweight, in some ways, worsens the disease. Uh, being overweight makes things much, much harder. And it's really hard to lose weight. And if you are, are significantly overweight, it's almost like this terrible catch-22 where you can't starve yourself. I mean, even if you cut down on your calories, your metabolism is going to slow down. And so many people um, may find themselves wheelchair bound, way overweight and super, super uncomfortable and it's unpleasant and they don't see an easy way out. Bariatric surgery is an option. Bariatric surgery has been studied in MS and in my opinion, it's the single best way to lose 100 pounds with MS. Um, bariatric surgery in 2019 is not what it was back in the day. It used to be a kind of invasive surgery where they cut you open and they rewired all your guts. Not anymore. Bariatric surgery nowadays can be done laparoscopically. Um, they have these really awesome banding techniques and sleeve techniques. Actually, uh, one of my colleagues, an amazing doctor, Dr. Max Carraro, who's an MS specialist down in North Carolina, his wife is a bariatric surgeon. Um, and so I've learned a lot talking with her over the years. The punchline here is, if someone's recommending bariatric surgery for you, I would explore it. Uh, oftentimes, leading up to bariatric surgery, there's nine months or 12 months of education and diet and, and, and a whole host of things that need to happen to get you ready for bariatric surgery. And so I would absolutely participate in that process. It's a very, very helpful process. And even if ultimately you don't get bariatric surgery, the learnings along the way are going to enrich you and they're going to make you more effective and they're going to help you lose weight. Um, bariatric surgery is an excellent option. 
I think that in the hands of a qualified bariatric surgeon, it can be very safe. Um, everything has risk, but being morbidly obese has risks. And so thumbs up to the option of bariatric surgery. I hope that you explore it. I hope that you learn more about it and look, look into it. And it might be a great option for you. Um, where are we? Um, big love to Dr. B. Thanks for sharing your story. Love right back at you. Um, Jen writes, uh, I read that one already. Um, all right, let's find the next question, guys. Josh Glover writes, hi, doc. I have MS and transverse myelitis, and I'm only 29 years old, and I was diagnosed two years ago. And since then, my world has been turned upside down. Watching your video really helps. Thanks. You know, 29 is young. Um, as I move farther and farther away from 29, 29 seems younger and younger. Um, my heart goes out to you. Uh, having an MS diagnosis, suffering from transverse myelitis can flip your word upside down. Now, I've had the privilege of working with people impacted by MS now for almost a decade and a half. And I want to share something with you. You're not done yet. You're not done yet. We're not finished. You're only 29, man. You got a lot going on. And you might not be able to conquer the world the way that you originally planned. You might not be able to um, activate and execute on the plan that you had before you had MS. But think about this. You may reinvent your plan. You may alter what you do. And you may end up in a place that's more exciting than you ever imagined. I have heard many, many people's stories, many people's stories, and it can be a dark place at first, but you may come out of this and you may do something colossal. So you have a challenge in front of you. You are a young, young person. You're only 29 years old. I challenge you in your heart to figure out what it is that you're going to do and what it is that's going to be a bit different. And I think that when you're 39 and 49 and 59 and 69, you're going to be in this world and you're going to be fighting and you're going to be awesome. And so I'm actually in some ways excited for you to figure out the next chapter of what you're going to do and how you're going to do it. Um, it's a privilege for me as I work with people in clinic who are impacted by MS to watch them go through this process. I feel the lows, but I get to experience the highs. And it can be very, very exciting. So keep in mind my message. We're not done with you yet. And I'm not done with this coffee. All right. I got Darla saying, hi, Dr. B. Darla, how are you? I love you. I hope that you're doing well. I hope that your kids are doing well. And thanks for jumping online with us. Um, Rotten One says, what should we expect upon the first visit, visit at a clinic? So Rotten One, that's a good question. I have a YouTube video that uh, says the, the things that you need to do to get ready for your clinic appointment. I think I came up with nine things. And so you might want to go to the YouTube channel and check out that video on uh, how to get ready for your uh, MS visit. But to speak in generalities, um, typically during uh, an MS evaluation, there's five parts. There's going to be uh, a clinical history. The clinician is going to listen to you tell your story. And what that means to me is that you want to do some homework. You want to review and write down um, when you had that first symptom and you want to be able to describe it and how it got better and um, how long it lasted and how intense it was and what made it better and what made it worse and which parts of the body were affected and what evaluation was done. And literally that history, they're going to walk through all the different aspects of what happened from that first symptom onset all the way up until today. And so you can do homework by getting that stuff ready and it'll make you more effective in sharing that with your provider. I love it when patients write it all down and hand it to me. Now we still talk, but I can read it and it helps enrich our conversation. That's the first thing. The second thing is there's probably going to be some form of neurological examination. Um, they're going to have you touch things and do like this and you know, they're going to feel and they're doing a neuro exam so they can look for objective evidence on exam to buttress what they hear in your history. Uh, at our center, we also do some very special functional testing with special visual testing, low contrast visual acuity. We do special cognitive testing, uh, screening with symbol digit modality testing. We do uh, functional tests of walking speed and functional tests of arm function. And all of this is collected to help us um, as part of the physical exam. The third thing that's going to happen is there are going to be some review of MRIs. And if you don't have MRIs, they're going to probably order MRIs. 
And if you've had MRIs, you want to bring the discs or the pictures to the provider. I don't want to see a report. I don't like to read a report because I don't know if the guy that wrote the report knew the heck of what they were talking about. Maybe they were reading the wrong scanner. Maybe they weren't good at their job or maybe they missed something. I want to read it myself. And so I need you to bring me the pictures. I want to see the MRIs themselves and I review those very, very carefully. The fourth thing that's going to happen is there's going to be some review of laboratories and other testing because when we're thinking about something that might be MS, we need to think about what else might mimic MS. Things like uh, metabolic conditions and vitamin deficiencies and thyroid dysfunctions and things like that. We also want to look at other connective tissue diseases. And so we're going to probably be getting screening to look for things like lupus and Sjogren's and rheumatoid arthritis, et cetera, et cetera. I also like to order laboratories to look for mimics of MS that are infections. And so there are some infections, things like Lyme disease, HIV, tuberculosis, hepatitis, that can mimic aspects of MS. And so I tell people, we're going to check syphilis, not because I think you have syphilis, but you're going to go to a family reunion and some smart aleck is going to say, how do you know it's not syphilis? And you're going to say, shut up, you already checked. And so typically those are the kind of things that are going to go on. And the fifth thing is to synthesize all that together to put it all together and to come up with a plan, a plan for further testing to lead to a diagnosis. And so that's a lot of what you might expect at an initial visit. Um, I put out a video last week on how do you diagnose MS and the five elements. And so if you haven't checked that out, you might want to check that out. Now, what do you expect during a clinic visit? And I'll give you an example of a, of a standard clinic visit. The clinic visit is going to involve many of the same parts. We're going to be listening to the human being about how they're doing. Have they had any new neurological deficits? Have they had any old neurological deficits that have gotten worse? Have they had any old neurological deficits that have gotten better? We're going to be asking questions about their medicine. Are they taking their medicine? Are they really taking their medicine? How often are they taking their medicine? Are they tolerating their medicine? Are they up to date with the safety monitoring for the medicine? Is the medicine working? Are they having attacks? Are they having new things on MRI? Um, we're going to ask about vocation. Uh, are you working? Are you having trouble at work? Are you missing work? Um, what's going on there? We're going to ask questions um, about invisible symptoms. I always like to ask about bladder. I like to ask about energy and sleep. I like to ask about mood. And I like to ask about thinking and memory. Because those are all very common MS symptoms that you can't see just by looking at someone. So I need to ask and listen. We're going to be checking um, exam findings. And I used to do a traditional neurological examination with every single patient because that's what I was taught to do until I realized that doing a traditional neuro exam with every single patient doesn't always help me very much. It takes 10, 15 minutes to do. And I have found that using special functional testing tends to help me more. So with, at our center, every patient that comes in gets a visual acuity. So we check their vision. We do a cognitive test. We do a hand function test called a, a nine hole peg test, and we do a timed 25 foot walk with every patient, every visit. And we track that over time. Me personally, I find those tools to be more helpful as screening tools than I do doing the traditional neuro exam. And then me personally, I like to do a spot check. So if your left hand function is uh, decreased, I, I do the testing and I see the numbers have dropped. Well, then I'm going to explore your left hand and then I'll examine your left hand. At least that's how I like to do things. At that clinic visit, uh, we're going to maybe order MRIs. Again, I like to give an MRI of the brain about once a year. And so if it's the visit where we're going to be reviewing that, we're going to be reviewing that. And then we're going to be talking and educating and planning how to make you more awesome, how to slow the disease down, how to quell inflammation and how to manage symptoms. So those are some of the things that we might be thinking about at a clinic visit. That's a great question. Thank you for asking it. All right. Um, so Sammy writes, cog fog. I got to start paying attention. I almost missed this. Hey, Sammy, thanks for being here. Um, cog fog is not very much fun, and I'm glad that you're here right now. And I certainly need to uh, pour a little bit more coffee. All right, guys, I'm uh, at the end of my coffee. 
until I can make some more. <laughs> so if you're at home and you're having a coffee with me, host zoom board. Oh man, I love that. Are, are, are you guys all familiar with this magical mug? This mug is very special to me. Um, I shared this story online before, but I just want to share it one more time. Um, I uh, have a wonderful patient uh, who's a member of a wonderful family. And uh, when I met her, uh, she was a couch potato. She literally just sat in front of the television. People would bring her her food and she would sit there and stare at the boob tube. And I encouraged her family to throw the television out and to not let her sit on the couch. And that's what they did. Um, I encouraged her to go find a hobby, to go do something. And I recommended that she do pottery. Now, I didn't really mean go do pottery. I meant go find an activity like pottery, except she actually took what I said verbatim. And she now made this mug for me. I mean, this thing is freaking awesome. Not just because it's a gorgeous orange color. This is the perfect handle and it's the perfect size. And I cherish this. And in fact, if you can see, it's been cracked multiple times. Uh, I've glued it back together. Um, no one in my family is allowed to touch this mug. This is my special mug, and I love it. Um, and I want to thank her from the bottom of my heart for making this for me. She's actually made me three or four mugs, and they're some of my most prized possessions. But this is probably my favorite. All right. Let's take a look at some other questions. Kathy um, is sharing a story. Susan writes in, hi, doc. I'm having a few weeks of really bad fatigue, way more than normal. Is this a sign of a relapse? It could be. It's been my observation that when someone's having a relapse, whether that be an optic neuritis or numbness of a leg or weakness of an arm or something like that, if you take a careful history, that human being typically has worsening fatigue and worsening cognitive function. If you're noticing that you're super, super tired and that's abnormal, I think that we need to explore it. It could be a relapse, but it could also be a worsening of something else. Sometimes we have profound fatigue because we have sleep problems and we're not sleeping properly at night. We're not getting enough hours of sleep or snoring, or we have sleep apnea, we have restless leg syndrome, we're getting up five times to pee and we're not getting restorative sleep. Um, you may have fatigue uh, because of depression, uh, and depression can make you more tired. I see that all the time. Uh, there's a myriad of things that can impact fatigue. I have an entire playlist on my YouTube channel about fatigue, and if you haven't checked that out, I certainly would look at that because I talk about all the different factors that can cause fatigue. I mean, quite honestly, I could probably list 20, 30 things right now that could all impact fatigue. There's a lot of things that we need to explore when someone's tired. Um, it could be an attack. It could be worsening a disease. Oftentimes, we can identify exacerbating factors. Sometimes someone started a medicine for spasticity or for depression or for bladder or for pain, and it's making them more tired. And so we really have to do a deep exploration to figure out what are the contributing factors of fatigue and how do you combat it. And again, go check out those videos on my YouTube channel, um, the playlist called MS and Fatigue, and I have a bunch of videos where I've talked about how to manage that. Fatigue is the most common symptom in MS, um, and it's one of the leading causes of loss of work in multiple sclerosis. So let's see here. Sammy writes, can the damage you're experiencing as a result of MS cause other odd things to happen in your thought process? Yes. So uh, Sammy, you know, we made reference earlier to cog fog, and there's a lot of different cognitive things that can happen in the setting of MS. Um, there is something called neuropsychometric testing, neuropsych testing, which is a functional battery, which is really a, a super a deep look at all different aspects of cognition working visual memory, working auditory memory, um, reading comprehension, auditory comprehension, processing speed, multitasking, all these different aspects. And I find that when people are having difficulty with thinking of memory to be very, very valuable to get that information to help us best understand what's going on. Um, there are things that can be done. Speech pathologists are brilliant people and they don't just help with swallowing. Speech pathologists don't just help with speaking. Speech pathologists can actually do rehabilitation for the thinking and memory, which is freaking cool. 
And so if you're having some difficulties with cognitive functioning or with thinking and memory, I want you to bring that to the attention of your MS provider. Remember, it's an invisible symptom. When your MS provider says, how are you doing? And you say, oh, I'm fine. Make sure that you're actually fine. Um, oftentimes when I see someone in clinic, almost all the time, I walk in the room and I say, hey, how are you doing? And they say, I'm good. And I'll say, are you being socially polite or are you actually really good? And I would say half the time they say both. And half the time they say, no, I'm not doing good at all. I'm actually doing really shitty. And I say, oh, okay, well, let's start with shitty. Uh, because, you know, we say things like, how are you doing as a, as a cultural hello? But when you're in the doctor's office, I'm not making a cultural hello. I really need to know how you're doing. And if you're having trouble with thinking and memory, I need you to bring that to my attention because there are things that we can do about it. Excellent question. Um, there are 112 people online right now. I am so filled with love inside that my heart's going to burst. This is so freaking cool. Thank you very, very much, everyone. I'm loving this online community and I'm loving your questions. Um, can MS affect vision other than optic neuritis? My ophthalmologist doesn't know why my eyesight has changed so drastically in only one eye. Yes. MS can affect the nerve that runs the eye in the back of the eye. And what we have found by studying something called OCT or ocular coherence tomography, um, which is looking at the, the, the back of the eye, um, is that there can be thinning of the retinal nerve fiber layer, which can impact visual acuity. And this can happen in the setting of optic neuritis, but it can also happen without optic neuritis. Um, so there can be problems with vision. Um, your ophthalmologist hopefully can, can look in the back of the eye. They can do an exploration there. Um, you might need to have an MRI or other testing um, to help sort that out. And if the ophthalmologist is struggling, they may want to refer you to a specialist, a neuro-ophthalmologist. So ophthalmology, um, these are doctors that study the eye. But the eye is made up of like many different parts. And there's actually subspecialist ophthalmologists. There's people that deal with cataracts. There's people that deal with retina. There's people that deal with um, the movements of the eye. And there are neuro-ophthalmologists. Neuro-ophthalmology is an extra year of specialized training. Um, neuro-ophthalmologists are some of the smartest women and men that I've ever worked with. And if your ophthalmologist needs a helping hand, they might send you to a neuro-ophthalmologist. All right, Josh Verity's online. What's up, my man? Josh, it's great to see you. I hope that you and your family are doing well on this Saturday. Um, I wish you the very, very best. Um, all right, guys. It is a, uh, I've been online now uh, talking with you guys for an hour and 22 minutes. Um, I intended to do this for an hour, but I thought I would go until my coffee runs out, which is happening soon. So um, I'll take one or two more questions, and then we're going to wrap things up today. Um, you know, I've told you guys before that I'm not very good at planning these live streams. Um, I would like to get to a point where I can tell you a week ahead of time or even 24 hours ahead of time that I'm going to do a live stream. And if I'm very honest with you, um, a lot of times on my weekends, uh, it's family time. I've got children. I've got my, my wife, and, and we're doing things. And so I, I don't always plan very well. Um, I found that I wake up way earlier than everyone else in my house. And so Saturday or Sunday mornings are a good time. I'm still working on it. Um, I, I'm still not going to quit my day job as a doctor. Um, I'm not super good at this just yet. And I'm sorry that I can't uh, give you a warning ahead of time. The fact that so many of you are willing to jump online at a moment's notice uh, makes me feel amazing. And I do commit to you that it's my goal ultimately to be able to give you a heads up and say, hey, next Saturday at 7. Um, right now, I'm still working on that. It's a works in progress, um, and, and, and I really appreciate your flexibility in that. Um, Sue says, go refill the Java. Um, because my amazing coffee maker is broken, I'm going to have to use this French press. So that involves boiling the kettle and so on and so forth. So I'm going to uh, drink this up, and then we'll probably wrap things up so that I can go recaffeinate. Um, Matt D writes, does MS damage the autonomic nervous system, heart rate, sweating, et cetera? That's a great question. Not very often. The autonomic nervous system is part of the peripheral nervous system. See, in neurology, we divide the nervous system central, peripheral. 
Central is brain and spinal cord. I kind of consider myself a central guy. And then there's peripheral neurology. So this is the, uh, the nerves coming off the spinal cord and then the, the connection of the, the nerves to the muscles and the autonomic nervous system, the fight or flight response or the rest and digest response, that's the peripheral nervous system. And so most commonly it's not affected. Rarely it can be. How? There's a part of the brain um, called the hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus drives the autonomic nervous system. And so it's the central piece that then controls the peripheral nervous system, the autonomic nervous system. Very, very rarely you can have damage to the autonomic nervous system because you have damage to the hypothalamus. I've seen that in my career maybe three or four times. It can happen. But if someone is having autonomic problems, dysautonomia, I want to look for other things outside of MS. I think that an MRI of the brain to look at the hypothalamus to see if there's lesions is a very appropriate thing to do. But I think that we have to keep in mind that it's extremely rare in MS. And so we want to look elsewhere. All righty. Last question. Uh, someone writes in, learn about MS with Dr. Aaron Boster. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, let's wrap up, guys. Let me wrap up by thanking all of you. Um, and I'm going to share with you another personal story. I, I, I just feel like, like talking a little bit. Um, all of us have dealt with trials and tribulations in our life. Um, and I um, have as well. Uh, and, and years ago, um, I lost my first marriage. Um, and my ex-wife uh, opted to leave. Uh, and we had a, a two-year-old. And um, that was devastating to me. Now, I love my son, and I get to have him half of his life. He spends a week with me and a week with his mom. Um, and that was one of the single hardest things that I've ever dealt with in my entire life uh, when, I, when I lost my first uh, wife to divorce. Now, keep in mind that I am happily married and that we've been married now for quite some time, and I'm happy as a clam. I'm talking about something that happened a long time ago, but I'm bringing it up to make a point. When I was going through my divorce and I was in the worst depression of my adult life, one thing made it okay. And that was my clinic. I would wake up in the morning and I would go into clinic and for 10 hours, it was okay. For 10 hours, I was all right. And I wasn't all right uh, because I was helping other people because really they were helping me. Um, I would go home at night and I was profoundly depressed. And the next day, the thing that, that made it okay was going back into clinic. So I really learned a lot about myself then. And my point here is, this is not a one-way street where I'm helping you. It's a two-way street because you're helping me. Um, I am a member of this community. And when I write hashtag, we have MS, I, I'm not intending to be silly. I don't have multiple sclerosis, but I've dedicated my career to beating up MS and helping people impacted by MS do better. But I want to be very transparent that you help me too. Um, this energizes me. This empowers me. This fires me up and gets me ready to go back into clinic and kick some ass. And so I want to end today by thanking you, by thanking the people from around the interwebs that have banded together to create this online community so that we can support each other and so that I can support you and so that you can support me. My name is Aaron Boster, and thank you for learning about MS with me. And until my next live stream or my next YouTube video, I wish you the very, very best and take care.